Welcome to Loop TV. I'm your host, Gene Munster, joined by guest today, Cellinks founder, Kevin Cloakley. Welcome, Kevin. The topic that we're going to be addressing is uh, near and dear to my heart more than I think you probably realize, Kevin. I'm going to uh, make sure it's all clear here. I'm 50 years old. That puts me kind of in my formal teenage years uh, in the 80s uh, with my wonderful brother, Jim. Uh, we loved to wrench on cars. He loved to do most of the hard work. He's a few years older than I am. Uh, Volkswagen Dasher, uh, Ford Escort, Omni Horizon. They weren't iconic cars, but my time with him was nonetheless uh, most memorable. And as we were wrenching on those cars, trying to install different stereos, um, speakers, uh, fog lights, uh, for example, there was always this uh, fishing around inside uh, the dash doing wiring, which gets us to our A topic today, cell link, the future of uh, wiring within passenger cars and other uh, moving vehicles. Uh, so I'm gonna pause there, uh, bring you and Kevin. Can you give us a one-liner on what cell link is? Sure, yeah, thanks Gene. Um, so Cellink is creating a sustainable electronic architecture for electric and autonomous vehicles. So uh, this is related to wiring. Uh, and when I think about uh, my days uh, back in the wrenching and uh, conventional wiring harnesses, uh, what do we know, like what's wrong with conventional wiring harnesses uh, the way it's been done forever? Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, it, it, forever is the key word. It's a it's a hundred year old approach to wiring um, vehicles that nowadays are becoming increasingly more like computers on wheels. Um, the complexity is growing exponentially, and the architecture of wiring has not changed, um, thus leading to an extreme pain point. Um, there are thousands of wires in cars today. Um, that's continuing to climb uh, exponentially. And um, that creates pain, not only in the cost of wiring a vehicle, um, the complexity of wiring the vehicle, but also to your specific pain of experiencing getting the wires into a car or manipulating them. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a real, real need to improve um, the way that, that vehicles are wired today. So more uh, electronics in cars, we're obviously seeing it now with some of the component shortages, it's, it's happening in auto, makes sense that there needs to be more connections in between that. And then there's also the connections within the battery, but maybe we can start with the car itself, the body of the car itself and think about what would be the advantages of, of, of having cell link and some of the, the flexible architecture that you have. I've heard some people refer to this as printed wiring. I don't know if that's language that you use, but What's the advantage maybe from uh, the, the highest level for in the, the manufacturing of the car? We'll start there. Yeah, so, so our, you know, our core technology is a, it's a, it's a flexible circuit, um, which essentially is a way of aggregating tens or hundreds or thousands of discrete wires into a single element. And what, what makes us unique is that we can make these circuits really large and very high conductance. So they can carry lots of current, which uh, but both of which are critical for vehicle wiring. Um, you know, the flex circuit revolution kind of took hold in computers and smartphones a long time ago, um, but we're now able to extend that to a vehicle. Um, and, you know, the, the, the analogy to think of is uh, once a long time ago, people realized that um, wiring the leads of microchips with wires made no sense and they came up with a printed circuit board. Um, we're looking to extend that same concept to a vehicle. Got it. I think that printed circuit board. So I guess the printed wiring is uh, it applies here too. And so from uh, you know assembly of a, a vehicle, uh, it would seem that instead of fishing these wires around, uh, having humans kind of go in and do that, this would it's more like a Legos kind of plugging uh, different uh, universal harnesses, flexible harnesses together. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, exactly. You're touching on one of the one of our value propositions, which is. Uh, pre-assembly, the concept being if you can integrate your wiring into um, other parts of the vehicle before you try to bring it all together, you can help address that, that pain point of watching the poor guy that's yanking the wiring through the car uh, during final vehicle assembly. Okay, so there is an advantage to the manufacturer to build uh, more quickly. 
is there a cost advantage ultimately? Is there, is there less wires needed and beyond, I guess, the time, the labor of, of assembly? Yeah, so there, there is a, so, so one of the things that's unique about us, um, and this, this actually comes from our, our origins, you know, I, I started working on cell like 10 years ago, my co-founder Malcolm Brown joined me seven years ago, it's amazing how time flies, but, um, you know, we started off trying to build a giant flex circuit for a solar panel, and um, we, we saw the, the price pressure of that industry being so immense that we completely reinvented the way that you would make a flex circuit. And in doing so, we, you know, to meet the needs of that kind of cost pressure industry, we, you know, realized that what we'd actually developed was perfectly well suited to compete against round wire. Um, so this gets to your question of uh, cost reduction. It's, it's, uh, it's a tough game in that round wire, you know, that's a very mature industry. Um, you know, there are football size field, uh, football field size factories in Mexico where people are making uh, massive amounts of, of wire harnessing for, for us. Um, but we do have the ability to compete on, on price and cost. And the reason is that we have a highly automated manufacturing process and we use much less material than you would need in round wire. And the other, the other benefit that comes along with that is weight reduction. So, um, you know, the, the weight of the wiring harnessing in a vehicle can be as much as uh, the weight of a person nowadays, even hmm. more. And so if you can cut that down by 70, 80%, you know, there's a significant fuel efficiency gain to be had by, by doing that or, or range gain if, if you're an electric vehicle. Makes sense. We've talked about the kind of the flex circuit piece of this, and then there's the battery uh, interconnections piece too. You are alluding a little bit to that kind of thing with some of the things in solar you're doing. Yep. But what, what exactly are you doing? In, are you actually having technology that goes inside of batteries too? We are, and it's a, it's a, it's a great, you know, um, low hanging fruit uh, application for us because, um, you know, batteries are getting bigger. If you've ever heard of something called um, cell to pack, that's a big trend in, in automotive battery design. Um, very high current, you know, being transmitted. That's something that our circuits are uniquely well suited to. Um, and, and then the automation piece, um, nobody wants to, to top off their beautiful battery module manufacturing line with a guy that's sitting there connecting things and, you know, soldering uh, leads and things like that. So, so the, 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 uh, the fact that our technology is very well suited to automated assembly plays nicely there as well. As you're describing what goes on inside a passenger car, I'm thinking about the broader conversation about electric vehicles, manufacturing, about traditional uh, car makers and the up and comers. And how do you think about the manufacturing overall? Is it something where there's a lot of learnings that these car companies have been on for a hundred years can use to kind of propel them into an electrified and uh, printed wired harness future? Or do you feel that uh, they really need to kind of start over in, in a sense and there's just so many different pieces, just like we're talking about the wiring element alone, that it is uh, really a whole new mindset. You know, I, I think it's a great question. Um, and I personally, in my experience, in our experience as a company, as a business, I think, you know, we would, we would see, what we see is more of the latter where um, some of the, the older OEMs um, change is very hard. Um, and even though they know a lot, um, sometimes they know a little too much in that um, you may find an engineer um, at one of these companies that, that their whole their whole mentality is um, figure out what your product doesn't do and then try to kill it. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, whereas the, the newer entrants, I would Wait, say, say they, that again. Figure out what your product doesn't do. Meaning, you know, so they'll have a checklist that they're using to compare your thing against this hundred-year-old class of brown wire harnessing, and uh, if you miss one of those boxes, oh, uh, gotcha. So they're using the the old lens to decide what to do in the future. Yeah, and and with good reason, I think uh, in 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 some cases, in that they have the experience of recalls and and uh, reliability issues, and they want to steer clear of that. And that is totally rational, but. Sometimes um, what we see is that the requirements just get pushed up and up and up over time to a point where it gets really hard for them to adopt new technology because they just see the risks and not the, not the gains. 
Whereas I think where um, some of the newer entrants might look at it and say, we're starting from a clean slate and we're also willing to challenge some of those old assumptions and, and maybe take a little bit more risk, but knowing that this leads to a much better result in the, in the long term. Got it. Maybe and on those fronts, I understand that uh, you have uh, understandably uh, don't want to share with those customers that you work with, but it sounds like you've got a good mix of, of both kind of the old and the new as you pursue kind of building your business for the, the future. So um, uh, one more question just on kind of the mechanics as I'm imagining these um, these, these flexible circuits, this kind of the future of wiring, these printed wiring inside of door panels and things like that. What happens in an accident is, is the cost of replacing the door panel go up exponentially because there's technology on the inside? You know, that's a, that is a question we get commonly, but I think the, the reality is that most, most OEMs are, are moving into a world of um, replace, not repair. Um, you know, the vehicles um, are getting uh, to, to a point in, in terms of complexity, they're getting to a point where having a technician go in to repair a wire just doesn't make sense anymore. Um, it's, it's much more common that you'll see an entire sub-module get replaced. And I think that's where, that's where we fit really well. Um, gotcha. You know, so they we don't, don't replace the whole car, they just like replace the whole door? Is, would that be the idea? Exactly, a sub, yeah, a sub assembly within the vehicle, and it's a faster repair, um, and and therefore ends up being a lower cost endeavor than than asking a guy to try to go in and find a you know a hidden hidden issue. Got it. Makes a yeah. ton of sense. And uh, let let's fast forward five years from now. Uh, twenty twenty six is uh, you know that it's uh, not a consumer brand that you have here, but you know what? How should we? Think about the the path ahead for selling. Where are you going to be in five years? Yeah. So if I uh, if I could make a little joke. So my hair was brown when I started this. So in five years it'll be white. Uh, but um, you know I, I love what I do, and um, you know selling is. Uh, so I had my kids right around the time that I started selling, and uh, it's sort of like my third kid. You know. Um, and so for me, you know, if you had asked me two three years ago what's what's selling's path going to be, I would have. I would have said acquisition by a bigger company. There's no way we can do this ourselves. Um, now, as time has gone on, you know, I think there's, uh, I'm getting increasing confidence that we, we can basically do this. Um, you know, our customers are, uh, we've had some great, amazing customers that have taken risks with us. We've met the challenge. We've shown that we can scale the technology up. Um, you know, we, we're seeing demand that's uh, outstripping supply next year by a significant margin. Awesome. Um, and so, you know, there's a, there's a great chance we could be a public company. Um, I, I don't want to commit to anything, you know, uh, but, and my co-founder Malcolm, he's, and, and other folks on our team would, would be a part of that decision too. But, um, you know, we're, we're seeing that the sky is the limit here um, and that we can really be a key player in the whole electrification movement. Duly noted, I picked up on that Easter egg that you just dropped related to, uh, you know, you just can't almost keep up with demand for what's on the plate for next year. I, I, that is a sign of a successful theme, tap into a big market. Are there any other markets uh, beyond automotive that you could see Cellink in uh, participating in five years from now? You know, I think the, the lightweighting theme, it, it does work really well with things that fly. Um, you know, I think, um, um, so that's, that's another future opportunity for sure. Our, our focus is really on consumer automotive at this stage. Um, but, um, you know, the, the opportunity to simplify wiring extends to almost any type of vehicle, including the ones that are airborne. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a path we'll, we'll eventually pursue. Makes a ton of sense. I can see how the pieces uh, play together. And uh, it goes without saying, we look forward to staying in touch uh, with you and the success in the future. On behalf of Kevin, Selink, uh, Gene, and Loop TV, thank you for joining and bye for now.